good news. It's Good News Friday. We'll just call it right there, Good News Friday. Because, you know, uh, you turn on the fear networks and you read the... I don't even get me going on the media these days because I, I, most of it's garbage and, and not, really, not really helping. That's another topic. We're going to give you some good news today because regardless of what's going on in this world, whether it's as bad as the media says it is, and in some cases it is, or whether they're just blowing it out of proportion, they're not telling you about the gospel, which is changing people around the world and ain't nothing slowing it down. And nothing can. That's the that's part of the good news. And so I have a couple of guests today who are going to share some stories of good news, and I just know it's going to lift your spirits. So let's get to this. If you're not familiar with the Gospel Coalition at gospelcoalition.org, uh, I'll throw that in the chat so you can go straight to it. But uh, it's it's a great website, and I have a couple of uh, key people there who have a new book out called Gospel Bound. Let me show you the book here. There's the book, Gospel Bound. It's by Colin Hansen, who's the editor-in-chief of the Gospel Coalition, and Sarah ekoff Zylstra, who is a senior writer at the Gospel Coalition. And this book is just full of good news. Uh, but you, please read it. It's, it's available now. You can pick it up. But we're going to tell you some of the stories. We'll give you a little sneak preview. So this will be a good one. Great to have you guys with me on Life Today Live. appreciate you being with me. Thanks for having us. All right. I like news Friday. It sounds great. So um, who wants to go first? Who wants to tell us a great story? Uh, you know what? I, I guess I should start with the typical question of why would you write the book? We'll get that out of the way. Uh, it seems obvious in this case, but maybe there's something I don't know. So why would you guys write this book? I can I can tell you that part. And then Sarah, she's the, the great story writer, and she can give you a lot of these stories. But... I think we wrote the book for a lot of the reasons that you just raised right there that so many of your viewers right now, all of you out there, you're not getting the full story. And it's not just a, a distorted story, but you're not getting, I would say, in so many ways, the real story of what God is doing around the world. Um, Sarah and I both have a background in journalism, both trained in journalism, been working in journalism for almost 20 years but one of the things we keep coming back to is you don't get any attention unless it's bad news. Um, I was talking with a pastor this last week. The Gospel Coalition had our national conferences and had people from all over the country, people watching all over the world, tens of thousands of people watching all over the world. And I was talking to a pastor who's had a faithful ministry over the course of decades, decades and decades of faithful ministry raised up. Uh, sons who walk with God and are doing great things in their communities. And I said, if you retire from your church, your local newspaper will not write anything about you saying faithful pastor has served for all of these years. But if something terrible were to happen in your family or one of your sons decided to say that you were a terrible person, well, then all of a sudden it would be front page news all over the place. And I said, we're getting a really distorted message then. It's not only stories you're not hearing, but the stories you are hearing are very selective. And I think that discourages a lot of Christians. At least it can be discouraging to me and to Sarah because we are so immersed in the day to day um, of, of all this stuff. And so we wrote these stories because they're true, because they're happening all over the country, all over the world. And also because we wanted to be encouraged ourselves in the middle of this. So, yeah, it's full of just all kinds of, we think, encouraging stories that we can also follow as Christians. Yeah. And, you know, they're true stories. That's what makes it even better. This is not just, I love books uh, about, you know, just encouraging people. But these are actual real stories. These are things that are going on. So let's jump in. And you guys pick one of the stories out, out of the book and just blow it up for us. Show us, show us what it's about. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story about a girl named Rochelle Starr. She lives in Louisville, and she was a marketing manager for her company. And a couple years ago, um, as she would drive to work, she would drive past a sign for a strip club. And um, she just had a burden on her heart for the girls who worked there. So she called her husband and said, man, I'm just really feeling I have a burden on my heart for the girls who work in the strip club. I think I need to help people in the sex industry. And he said to her, that's what Jesus would do. And so my favorite thing is she didn't 
she didn't write a vision statement. She didn't come up with a board of directors. She didn't uh, come, you know, ask people for funding. What she did is she took some of her girlfriends and she went and would sit across the street on the curb, across the street from the strip club on Tuesdays and Thursdays for a year. And they would just pray. And then she kept doing it and kept doing it and kept doing it. And I'm just thinking, man, I bet like eight, nine, 10 months in, that was getting pretty old. Like nothing seems like it's happening. But finally, after about a year, she felt like it, God was putting on her heart. It was time to go in. So she went inside and she was scared to death and wore a turtleneck and no makeup and didn't know what to do. She'd never been inside a place like that before. And it was dark and the lights um, were flashing. And she went over to the um, owner of the, of the club and said, I'd like to do something kind and loving for the women who work here. And he was like, I'm sorry, what, what, did, what do you want to do? Um, and she said, I, I'd like to do something kind and loving for the girls who work here. Could I bring in a meal? And he said, I've, you know, what do you mean? And she said, well, I'm a Christian. And he said, I've never, I don't think I've ever had a Christian in here. I've seen them picketing outside, but I've never knowingly had one in the club. And she said, well, here I am. So he let her bring in a meal. Um, and the, so she and those girls from her church fried up some chicken and got some mashed potatoes and, and some green beans. And in they come with their meal for these girls and laid it out for them. And um, the girls reacted in a lot the same way. Some wouldn't even eat it because they were afraid it was poisoned. Um, but it was just, they, then they came back and said, could we do it again the next week? And they did. And the next week, and they did. And of course, what would happen if we ate together week after week after week is we would start to become friends and trust each other and tell each other things. So they started telling her things like, I'm on heroin and I can't get off, or I, I never wanted to be here. I wanted to go to culinary school, but through the twists and, and brokenness of my life, here I am. Or one girl, she went to um, help her carry some things to her house. And she said, the only thing in her whole apartment was a Disney princess sleeping bag. She didn't even have a pillow. Rochelle didn't know what to do with these things because she, she was the only one she knew operating in this space. She didn't know where to send these girls. So one by one, she just tried to help them herself. So she said to her church, like, hey, can we furnish this apartment? And if you say that to a church, you know what happens. You're going to get a parking lot full of their couches and dishes and all the things that they, um, so they filled up her apartment with things. Um, she eventually, she tried a couple of different things. It's very dark and difficult place to work. Um, but she just kept working and working and working in there. And now she is in, she's operating in every one of Louisville's strip clubs. She has opened a bakery called Scarlet's Bakery. Um, and they ha now actually have three locations because if you're going to pull a girl out of a, something that's making her money, you have to give her another way to make money. Otherwise she doesn't know what to do and she'll go back to it. So they, they work in these bakeries. She's now expanded into five other cities um, and is teaching other people how to do this too. It's not easy. It's dark. It's hard. Sometimes you work with a girl for a while and then she commits suicide or slides even deeper in. Um, but they have pulled more than 600 girls from the sex industry and have seen thousands of lives touched and hundreds of people come to the Lord. And it has been just a beautiful story of one girl saying yes to what God was asking her to do. And, you know, I like, I like the way you phrase that. Um, Colin, what do you see in these stories when people just are willing to say yes to what they feel like God's asking them to do? I think a lot of what we feel right now in the culture is so discouraging and it can be debilitating almost like it doesn't matter if I do anything mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if I if I take this step if I do this thing but you, you you put it you put it effectively right there just saying yes to God means in many cases doing what's right in front of you it's taking the next step it's not starting with I'm going to change the world I'm going to it doesn't start with that. Nobody starts there. It starts with prayer. That's the number one yes to God. It starts with studying his word and knowing his word so we know what he wants from us to say yes to. It's not necessarily listening forever to hear a, a clear audible voice, but to clear, but to hear from God clearly in his word there. And then it just means taking that next step. Um, just like Sarah talked about right there, Rochelle didn't didn't know how this was going to turn out. She didn't know she'd have this kind of success. She didn't even know what kind of greeting that she would get from these owners or from these women. But she knew that she was she was supposed to take that next step to get involved. And I hope that for the people who are watching out there, that that can be an encouragement to you that at a time of, of a lot of discouragement, what's happening in this world seems like things are falling apart in so many different ways. 
God has still given you a sphere of influence with your family, with your neighborhood, with your community, and with your church. And God wants you to say yes to your responsibility to love and to care for those people. It just starts that simple, and maybe God will bless that in other ways, but every true revival among God's people starts that way. Mm, yeah, so true. And I, I find myself wondering, and I'm, you guys probably don't know the answer to this, but how did that club owner feel when when uh, allowing the meals starts losing his employees? I don't know. I don't know if we know the answer to that. I do. I know do the you? answer to that, yeah. Um, because she's had it happen more than once. So on the one hand, the club owner wants these girls to be, you know, healthy and, you know, you don't want your girls crying or they're in a difficult position. Um, so on the one hand, they love for Rochelle and her team to be there because they're caring for them. They're, um, they're helping them along. But on the other hand, one club owner kicked her out one time because she's like, I love having you guys here, but you're taking all my employees. Like I got, I still got to keep running my business. And so it's bet it's sort of a push and pull there with the club owners. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. I'm, I'm impressed that, you know, that, you know, the backside of that, because let's face it, not everybody appreciates, um, when we obey God, there's some opposition sometimes. I know there's some stories in your book, especially overseas, where you 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 say yes to God, you're going to be persecuted. Tell me about some of the some of the situations you, you've seen, maybe outside the United States or Canada. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I traveled to Kuala Lumpur last year before the COVID pandemic really took off. Um, and met, I was at a conference and there was a lot of mainland Chinese house pastors there and I was able to speak with them and a couple of things that they said were really striking to me. Um, one is that um, they, they were really feeling like the, the persecution that they face is God's, it's not something they're looking for and embracing but they see that as God's discipline on them. So it's also not something they're running away from. So where you and I might be like, oh no, we're in an uncomfortable situation. What's everything that we can do to make this more comfortable or safe or secure for ourselves. Um, that's not how they're looking at it. They're looking at it as like, I'm making a choice here. And maybe it's going to be a choice not to put a communist flag up in our sanctuary, sanctuary because they just are meeting in little houses or offices. Or maybe we're making a choice um, not to send our sermons to the police ahead of time as they have requested. Um, but, but we were walking into that knowing that if we made another choice, things would be easier for us, but we're obeying God in this one thing. And we are trusting that it is safer to be in the will of God than to be outside of it. So it's safer to be working here than it would be one pastor I talked to said, I got a job offer in the United States and I chose to go to China. And I was like, why would you do that? You'd be so much safer here. And he's like, because it's safer to me to be in the will of God it's safer to be in the lion's den or in that fiery furnace with God with you than to be outside of it somewhere that looks safe, but isn't really. They had a lot of, it was super interesting to talk to them. And they tell lots of stories about how God has been with them in prison, um, how God is with their family members. They're really looking to, oh gosh, they have such a great view of heaven. And the more they pin their mind on that, and the more they remember, this is not our home, the more patient they can be and the more gentle they can be they can look at that police officer and not be angry and furious that he's wasting their best life yet by them having to be in jail. And instead look at him with pity and compassion and think, Hey, for forever, I'm going to be with Jesus. And I don't think you are going to be. So my goal here is to bring you along with me. I love it when Christians respond that way in, in situations where you feel like that guy's, that girl's the enemy and God's like, no, actually I, I love them as much as I love you. And mm -hmm. I've sent you into their lives to, to impact that person for, for the kingdom's sake. There is one thing I notice in a lot of these stories, and there's different levels. And frankly, I think if you talk to some of the people, they won't bring this up. But typically there is a level of, of sacrifice, whether it's, you know, in, obviously in China, you may be sacrificing your freedom or your very life. You know, in the West, it's a sacrifice of time of money, sometimes of reputation. How, how prevalent is that in your book when you tell these stories that, yeah, if we're going to say yes to God, there is a cost sometimes. I think that's exactly what Jesus told us to expect. Mm -hmm. He was pretty explicit about this. He said, if they hated me, they will hate you. 
And one of my favorite verses, I always go back to John 16, 33, in this world, Jesus tells us, you will have much trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I, I, that's a wonderful passage, but I often stop and wonder, in what sense? What, what does he mean? Uh, because it's obvious that evil is still rampant in this world. Um, it's obvious that Christ is not, uh, not, not ruling in the most explicit ways that we can see in our government and even in our churches in many different ways. So how has Jesus overcome the world? Well, Jesus has overcome the world through the way that he does, through sacrificing himself, laying down his life for his friends. Greater love. There is no greater love than this. And so that's what it looks like for us to do likewise, is to lay down our lives for our friends. And in fact, Jesus went even further and he laid down his life for many people who were his enemies. And we see that most evidently in the life of the Apostle Paul right there. Paul, Paul, why do you, or Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And so what does Paul do when he, when he encounters the risen Christ? What does he do? He then goes and does the same thing. He gives his life for his friends. He gives his life for, for even his enemies. He loves his enemies. He refuses to get drawn in. So I think it's, the solution for what we do in a place where we feel like there's so much more pressure and so much more persecution that we're going to have to sacrifice, there's not some sort of new, elaborate, grand, sophisticated strategy. It's the basics of Christianity. It's the basics of what Jesus told us to expect and what he did. It's the basics of what Paul did and told us to expect. It's the forgiveness that transformed Peter's life from having betrayed Jesus, having been restored then. And Peter's then sent away saying, you know, Jesus asked him, do you, do you love me? Then feed my sheep, then care for my people. That's what we're called to do. As we love Jesus, we care for one another. We love even our enemies. And, and uh, there's not, just like you started off with this show, like that's the gospel that cannot be daunted. That's the gospel that cannot be stopped. That's the gospel that among the apostles was seen to have turned the world upside down. That's the gospel that we have to get back to today so that together as a church, we can move forward through today's challenges. Mm -hmm. We're talking to Colin Hansen and to Sarah Zylstra. This is their new book. It is called Gospel Bound, Living with Resolute Hope in an Anxious Age. It is available now and it's full of even more stories than you're hearing today. Just getting a sample today, which I'm thrilled to bring you, but you can pick up the book wherever you buy books. And uh, this is the website, thegospelcoalition.org, uh, thegospelcoalition, all three words, dot org. And you can see some articles that they've written and you get some more good news there. So, you know, feed yourself on some good news. There's, there's some, it is out there. One thing about the internet, uh, they get these whole webs things is that there is good stuff out there, too, so feed on that. I want to ask you uh, about something that I'm, I'm noticing in these stories, uh, and that is you and I, I I'm, I'm guessing, I, I don't know of anything off the top of my head, but I'm guessing that if we start talking doctrine and theology, we'll quickly run into something that we don't 100% agree on. We maybe see it a little bit differently, and, and Lord knows, you know, you get into different dom denominations, there's things that we legitimately disagree about. We agree on the core issue of, of Christ, uh, the Messiah, died for our sins, resurrected. You know, the, these are all core things that we, we have to believe on, I think, to, to be able to work together, um, in, in his name at least. Uh, but there, there's a point where just showing love, just showing compassion, just showing mercy kind of covers... I don't know, where we may be a little doctrinally questionable, and I'm not advocating that we, we, we try to go there, but I notice a pattern in Scripture, which is, you know, when you, when the great, the Jesus' two commandments, love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself, he says nothing about doctrine there. And, and again, I don't mean, I don't want to dismiss it, but I, I see a pattern in both Scripture and in the stories that you tell where, you know what, if, if you just... Do your best to, to hear God and to obey, 
and show some love and some kindness and some mercy to people, you're probably going to be okay. Is that any kind of thread that, am I picking up on anything that's, that's correct in these stories? Well, I, I think you are. One of the things that Jesus also said is the world will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have for one another. Mm. And one of the things that really led to this book from the beginning was as I was going through Paul's letters, I was going through the book of Romans. Same thing happens later in Galatians. And I noticed this little phrase, it comes up in Romans 2, and says, obey the truth. And I thought, okay, well, we talk a lot about defending the truth, believing the truth. I don't hear us talk a lot about obeying the truth. And so the way we conclude this book is with a, with a chapter called No Apology Necessary. And there's kind of a double meaning at play there. One of the meanings is when you talk about apologetics or defending the faith, we often think of this as a mental category. But the best apologetic going back to the first and second centuries of the church is when the church dwells together in unity and love that flows out to their neighbors and to their community. That's the apologetic that is going to appeal to the world also today. And as we do that, we will then be undermining the greatest apologetic against the church today, which is all of the scandals and all of the infighting and all of all of that. I mean, we of course believe that there are different issues that are really important as Christians, but but there's ways of thinking about them. There are first order issues that we all have to agree on. There's second order that put us in different churches and different denominations. There's third order that don't even have to divide us in our churches. But a lot of what we should be focusing on are those, those first order issues. But even beyond that, just loving each other across those divides, the, it's a tremendous argument against the church when people can't see us love each other across our disagreements, let alone us be able to love our unbelieving neighbors across disagreement. And so that's a lot of what we're hoping this book can help to accomplish. So any other people out there who are excited about that, we hope that they can join into this gospel bound movement to see this break out in churches today. Yeah. Yeah. I, you kind of, you kind of can't go wrong. I mean, I mean, now, neither of us would advocate for sin, but when the scripture does say love covers a multitude of sin, I think it's okay maybe because we're going to make mistakes. We're going to miss the mark. Why not at least be loving and get a little covering in the process? Anyway, Sarah, I, I think we've got time for one more story. If you want to pick one out of, out of the book, Gospel Bound, uh, I'd love to hear another another story of good news. I'd love to do that. And I'm, I'm going to tell one that I, I hope will fit into what you and Colin were just talking about. There is a city in Iowa that's called Cedar Rapids and it's 86% white. So it's a very white city. And there were two churches that were there and one was a predominantly white church, but the pastor there really had a heart for multi-ethnic ministry. He just could never get anybody besides white people to come to his church. And there was also an African-American church and that pastor there had a desire to reach his city. Well, his city is 86% white, so he knows he's gonna have to diversify, but he couldn't get anybody except African-Americans to come to his church. It's the way their cultures were, we know how this goes, right? Once you have a critical mass, it's just like, how are we gonna diversify this? <clears throat> well, these pastors ran into each other and they liked each other just as people and they started praying together and they weren't praying for their own diversity necessarily, but they were praying for their city, they were praying for each other's churches, they were praying for their families, um, just kind of this regular intentional prayer. And if you'll notice, that's the same thing Rochelle started. And I'm just going to tell you, many, many of my stories start with this regular intentional praying of Christians together. So they were doing this for a while, and then eventually they did a pulpit swap, which is totally normal. And then they said, let's do an Easter service together. And as they were sitting at this Easter service, they were listening. These pastors were sitting in these empty pews, listening to the choir's practice to get ready for the service. And they were talking with one another. Both churches were healthy and growing. And the Black church pastor said, you know what? I've been look, we're, we're outgrowing our space. And so I'm just looking for another place to be in and nothing seems to be quite right. This one's too big. This one's too small. This one's just not quite right. I don't know what to do. And the white church pastor said, you know what? Um, it wouldn't be too big if we did it together. And there's a moment of total silence in which the white pastor thinks I'm a giant idiot. Why did I even open my mouth? I wish I could take that back. And the, and the black pastor says to him, are you serious? And he said, I am serious. And then the black pastor says, I have been thinking the same thing. 
So they talked to their wives who said, let's do it. They talked to their elder boards who were like, well, we're not jumping right in, but let's talk to us more about that. Um, and they worked, they, they, they talked with one another and they looked at their doctrine, which was close enough that they could come together. Um, they thought about their culture. They pre, and then eventually they presented it to each of their churches who voted 98%, both of their congregations in order to do this. Now you're not just going to be able to walk into a church in America and have them vote 98% to join with a completely different culture. But if you have a pastor whose heart is for the gospel and to reach other people and who's talking about, Hey, maybe we need to be a little bit uncomfortable. Maybe we need to get close to those people, you know, to reach them. Like how, if our goal, our desire is to share this generosity of the Lord that we have, how can we possibly do that? What can we do? Then you'll have people who are also thinking the same way and whose hearts are generous in the same way. And so they combined them. they combined together. They called themselves new city church. Um, they have been worshiping together. And at first, of course, it's awkward. They kept everybody from both staffs. They were able to do that. And they would do every other week, the, the other lead pastor, they kept both of their lead pastors. It was difficult sometimes with the worship levels. Um, you're combining two very different cultures, but their, the desire of their congregations was such that they kept working it through. And now they have been together long enough that they feel less like two congregations joining and more like one congregation with its own story. Um, they moved into the bigger facility and they, they use the faci other facility as an outreach center. And so they're able to, to start running more outreach programs, which both the churches have wanted to do. Um, people are attracted to that. More people are coming to the church. It's just been a beautiful like one step at a time. They just did the next thing that was in front of them. And just like you guys were saying too, like, to know somebody else, the love that covers so much stuff, holding on to those central issues and um, letting a love cover all kinds of other divides. Yeah, you know, one one thing that I think tends to happen um, when people hear stories like this is they is they think, oh, I need to, I need to do something big. I need, but, but as we exit here. What would you, I mean, we kind of touched on, I think, the basics, but I think the most important thing is just hearing hearing God for yourself because God's not really into cookie cutters. You know, he created us uniquely for a unique purpose that only we can fulfill. What would you say to somebody just to encourage them to, to be another story? Yeah, just do the next thing. You don't know what, what the Lord has for you. We very quickly, we talk about Alex and Brett Harris. They wrote a book as teenagers, Do Hard Things. Who knew that Alex would end up clerking for two Supreme Court justices and being in a very high powered position after going to Harvard Law School? Who knew that Brett would end up caring for a wife through all kinds of different debilitating diseases? You just don't know what tomorrow brings, but today is the day of the Lord and he calls you to simply take that next step of obedience with him and to seek him in his word and to seek him in prayer. The more complicated this world gets, the more we believe we've got to get back to the gospel and keep it simple. Well, the last question I want to touch on real quick is, is the website, um, the Gospel Coalition, which is right there. Um, and and I've, I've gone to this from time to time, but I, I confess that I'm not as familiar with it as, as I could be. And so I'm curious, either one of you who are what is sort of the goal? What what do you what is the purpose of, of the Gospel Coalition? We're just trying to be a resource to church leaders to help them to love God and to love their neighbors. That's what all of our stuff does. We we try to encourage them in soul, in spirit, in practical ways with discernment toward what's happening in the world. And we want them to be able to take those those resources, podcasts. I also do a gospel bound podcast as well. Our podcast conferences, just wrapping up those national conferences, books, um, articles, theological journals, all kinds of things. But all of it is just pretty simple. We're trying to produce these resources to help churches to make disciples of all nations. So if your church needs help making disciples of all nations, that's what we're trying to do there. Also, we, we do a lot of book reviews. So if you're looking for more books like this, is a great place to come check out to see if they're solid gospel-centered resources or or not. We do a lot of that to be able to help discerning readers as well. 
Oh, great. I'll send you I'll send you my latest book or maybe I won't, because if you say it's <laughs> not, <laughs> it could backfire on me real quick. <laughs> I, I appreciate both of you guys in, in sharing, taking the time to put together these stories to encourage people and sharing them with our audience. Thank you for everything that you do. Thanks for having us. Appreciate you guys hanging out watching. A little Life Today Live. Hope you've been lifted today. Hit share if you haven't subscribed or followed. Do that now. And come back next week. Got more great interviews lined up to encourage you. And I will see you next time here on Life Today Live. <laughs>